Disaster Class is part of the Readiness Lab, the home for podcasts, webinars, and training in the field of emergency and disaster services. Hello, everyone. I'm Jason Perez. And I'm Wesley Long. And we're bringing you a fresh new take on disaster preparedness. Welcome to Disaster Class. All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Disaster Class. I'm Jason Perez. I'm Wesley Long. And we have a very special episode today. In fact, we're going to dedicate this entire episode to start talking with our special guest. So we would like to welcome former acting secretary of the United States Department of Homeland Security and FEMA administrator, Pete Gaynor. Pete, welcome to Disaster Class. Welcome, Jason and Wesley. It's great to be here. <laughs> Thanks. We're really happy to have you. Um, First of all, um, I think Wesley and I just want to say thank you for the work that you uh, do and for your service. Um, as first responders, we know that often it's in the emergency disaster services, it can be kind of a thankless job sometimes. So we first and foremost wanted to say thank you. And, You're welcome. And FEMA administrator is really no easy job, to say the least. And uh, in fact, during your time as administrator, you oversaw some 300 presidentially declared disasters, um, one of the most active uh, Atlantic hurricane seasons in history, and not to mention the agency's first ever pandemic response. So, um, and, and I think you're also part of the White House task force with that too. So to say yep. that you had a lot on your plate I think is a little bit of an understatement. So, so Just thank you. Just a little you. bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, now, our, our listener base is, is comprised mostly of the general public, uh, people who don't necessarily have experiences in emergency disaster services. So I wanted to start out by asking you if you could help our listeners better understand FEMA. Um, because in our perception, sometimes there, there seems to be a little bit of a disconnect of what FEMA actually does versus what the public's per perception um, of FEMA is. So uh, could you explain a little bit about what FEMA's primary responsibility is and what what they actually do? Sure, sure. But, but let, me, let me first say, because it's, and I think this maybe be, is a perception problem, right? That FEMA is, is like, does it all. And it, it really is not. So I spent most, the majority of my emergency management career as a local, as a state, and then as the federal emergency manager. And there's a little um, mantra that we have at, at, uh, at FEMA is, locally executed, state supported, um, state managed and fairly supported, right? So mm -hmm. executed at the lowest levels, uh, managed by state entities, right? Should a, a local run out of capacity or need help. And then from the federal level, supporting all of that. Uh, in that in that little, uh, you know, three level description, it, it doesn't say first FEMA as a first responder. Uh, so I think many people think that uh, FEMA is a first responding agency. Uh, although we do have some first responders like urban search and rescue, but that's very unique and for unique circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, so the role, like the, 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 the overarching role of FEMA is really to uh, coordinate uh, the federal response for a disaster. And so a disaster can be a hurricane, flooding, and over the past two years, a pandemic. And, and again, a little bit, at least initially, a little bit out of uh, FEMA's uh, traditional role as a as a coordinator. So, uh, from preparing to preventing mitigation, responding to, recovering from, uh, uh, you know, all those things. That's kind of FEMA's role. So we are the we are the coordinator that uh, brings together and at the federal level, all the power of the federal government. Right. So whether it's DOD Department of Defense or it's Health and Human Services, or it's uh, any other agency within the federal government, uh, FEMA's role is to kind of coordinate all that, come up with a solution, and apply that to the problems. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. Okay, that's a really good explanation. You talked about those three tiers. Um, so FEMA, federal, overarching. So what would you then say is kind of like the state and then local government's responsibility as it relates to FEMA? Yes. So, um, you know, uh, again, I've had a unique position where I was a local emergency manager in, right. in the city of Providence for seven years. Uh, and and it, essentially, it, it's not much different. Obviously, it's, you know, lower, lower scale, 
uh, more intimate because you are the first line of defense when a disaster happens. Uh, you know, I mean, if you're a mayor in a, in a town, you really are the only one that's responsible for like filling potholes, picking up the trash, uh, responding to fires, right? There really is no other, even like governors don't have any of those, general don't, generally don't have those those daily responsibilities. So you are in the trenches as a local emergency manager, but your responsibility is to make sure that uh, you are prepared uh, based on the risk for your community to respond uh, and, and build that capacity at the lowest local level, right? Uh, and where you don't have the capacity, uh, you can tap into state and federal preparedness grants like uh, you know, Homeland Security grants, UASI grants, emergency management performance grants uh, to close that gap to build out local uh, response capability. And if you think about the math on it, right, so um, if every local uh, emergency manager had full capacity, then that would translate into states having a, a really complete capacity, which translates into a nation that is truly uh, has capacity in depth at every level. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, and, and in some cases, uh, that's that's true. Uh, but in most cases, I think uh, we still have a lot of work to do yeah. to make sure that all those gaps and shortfalls are uh, are uh, filled in. I mean, it's, an, it's a never-ending cycle, yeah. right? Yep. Uh, but you have a responsibility as a local emergency manager, as a state uh, director, uh, to make sure that your program is robust, has capacity. And then when you need help, uh, you know, FEMA and the federal partners are the backstop to that. Right. Yeah. yeah. Makes total yeah. sense. So and it, and it really goes along the lines of what we're doing with this show, and what we're doing with our company. And let me ask this question, right? Uh, the responsibility of the individual. Right? So you talked about the three tiers and then underneath that, you've got the individuals, families, the households, all of that. A lot of times uh, when disasters happen, the individuals on that level kind of think, oh, it's FEMA's job to come and clean up. Right. Or it's the local municipalities job to come clean up what do you feel is and or should be the responsibility of individual citizens when it comes to preparedness mitigation and overall community resiliency you know how do they fit into the big picture yeah yeah it's and it's a great question right and, and it really is i think the essence of of like becoming a resilient nation right it is really starts with the individual uh, and, and I look at it as uh, you know, like an inverted pyramid, right? So mm -hmm. the tiniest little point down at the bottom, that's you and me, right? Mm -hmm. That's you and me taking some action today to be more prepared. So uh, I'm going to uh, buy a phone charger or I'm going to get a, I'm going to renew my flood insurance or I'm going to do something else to make myself more resilient, more prepared for, you know, whatever uh, might happen in my community. Yep. Uh, and, and I understand the risk in my community because I've researched that because you have to research the risk in order to, in order to figure out what to prepare for and how to prepare. Uh, and then, you know, as it goes up, you know, your family gets prepared, your neighborhood gets prepared, your community gets more prepared, your state is prepared. And then ultimately, you know, the up at the top where there's the, the largest section is the nation is prepared, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, in some cases, I think we look at it backwards where we're trying to like push preparedness down. Mm -hmm. right. It really has to stop from the bottom and build up because I think, again, uh, that's how you really uh, uh, are, are ready for what may uh, impact your, your community, your yeah. family, your business. Exactly. Yeah. That's, yeah, we can't agree more. We, we, yeah, <laughs> we, we really can't agree more. In fact, like we, we've talked a little bit about this offline, but we are our community education program that we've been working on for the past few years. And that's kind of like our whole our whole motto. And we actually, stick. our, our, yep. uh, our little slogan we have for it is preparedness starts at home Yep. for resiliency, yep. all that stuff. As you were just talking about, it's a, it's really a ground up approach, not Excellent. a top down. Um, yeah. so yep. yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I think this is, this is, this is the, the preparedness challenge, right? Mm -hmm. Um, even though I think we've made some headway in preparedness as a nation, we still have a ways to go. And I, and I, and, you know, and I have, I've had the opportunity, uh, to travel around the nation to see every kind of disaster you can imagine and then some, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you get into these neighborhoods and you, you talk to those disaster survivors that have been impacted, that have, that have in, in some cases, have lost every single thing, like take a California wildfire, right? Have lost everything. There's, there's nothing left to, to salvage, right? 
uh, and, and you start talking to them and they just say, well, you know, do, what did you do to, did you prepare? And, you know, some of them are very honest with you and say, no, I, I, I really didn't do anything because I never thought it was going to happen to me. I only yeah. thought this happened to those on TV. Yep. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's Somewhere another else. neighborhood, another state, right? Not to me. And you, you have you have to scratch your head a little bit about, you know, uh, people not really appreciating the risk where they live. And the risk is different everywhere. So, you yep. mean, you know, wildfires, maybe in California, are one of the things you really have to be out, uh, look out for. But, you know, you live in, you know, a more risk tolerant state, maybe in the Northeast. And, and but there still is risk. Mm-hmm. There is no zero risk in this nation. So uh, you need to understand uh, and understand that risk and then take some action to to reduce that risk. Yeah. So in connection with what you're just talking about, so, you know, you, you've had so much experience in seeing all these variety of types of disasters and hazards. So in, in your opinion and, and what you've been able to witness personally, what are some of the biggest gaps that you've identified when it comes to individual preparedness, individual yeah. you know, readiness? What are, what are the so, things that people should be doing yeah. that they're not? <laughs> so we, we were chatting before we started rolling tape. And, and, and so I think we both have the same viewpoint about mm-hmm. being practical on some of these things. Yeah. So, so uh, I, I, I try to use the phrase, just imagine, right? Just imagine, uh, right? I, I take your phone from you and I tell you to, to dial, you know, a, a close relative's phone number. Do you know that phone number? That, I mean, do you, do you know it in your head or do you need your phone to, uh, yeah. to know the number? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. I, you know, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm a lot older than you guys, but I still, I, in my head, I still remember phone numbers from places I grew up 50 years mm-hmm. ago. I yep. still know those numbers. But today, right, if I have to, like, my, I'm looking for my, my daughter's number, I don't know it. I have to look in my phone to, to know that number. And so if, you, if your phone doesn't have any juice or it gets wet or you lose it and you need to call someone, yeah. what is your plan to dial, to dial that number if you don't have it? I mean, it's a simple thing. So yeah. have you printed out? your contacts from your phone on a piece of paper and put them somewhere like in a Ziploc bag. Mm-hmm. That's prepare. That's preparedness, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a small little piece of it, yep. but it, but it's like practical. It is. Um, you know, if you don't have access to your prescriptions for your medications, where are they? Are they on your phone with all your other photos? Right. Is it like the, like, okay, where's everyone's um, uh, copy of the vaccination card? Yeah. It's on your phone in your photos thing because that's what you use to show people that you're vaccinated, <laughs> right. right? But if you don't have your phone, I mean, you can just imagine all the things that you would you need your phone yeah. for. That if you don't have your phone in a disaster, what are you doing? How do you get money, right? right. You know, can you can you receive a Venmo from someone? Can you go to an ATM? Can you see the balance in your account? All these can you transfer money to a relative or have a a, a relative transfer money to you if you need it? So it's all these kind of things that. When you start thinking about it, you should get a little start getting a little nervous and a little sweat beating you off your, yeah. your yeah. brow about about just like right, how about a non disaster day if you lose your phone, right? We all freak out if we lose our phone. So That's very true. Th- this is the kind of practical stuff I think we need to, and, and it doesn't cost any money, right? Yeah. And this is the other part of preparedness. Um, you know, you guys are in the business of you know you have you know kits and they're scaled, um, and and you know that that. That's a certain segment of the of the nation that can afford that, but it's a whole nother segment of the nation that can't afford it, right? right. Sure. Uh, but that doesn't mean because you can't afford it, you can't do things to prepare. So mm-hmm. again, I think it, but you guys kind of have it it's scalable, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and in some cases, that scale uh, needs to be like low cost and no cost. I mean, that's kind of where we all have to start from. Yeah, yep. it's uh, it's funny you say that because. Uh, a lot of these concepts you're talking about, we teach in our class. And that's actually one of the things we, we do when we're talking about communication plan. Yeah. We'll do that with the students in our class. You'll be like, all right, who can tell me the phone number of so-and-so in your house without looking at your phone? Yeah. And, yeah. And, yeah. and it's true. We're so reliant on technology now. And uh, yeah, and it's, but like, as you said too, it doesn't take, it's, it's not super expensive to start doing these very practical things. In fact, you know, the best thing, the, our official stance as a company is the best go bag is the one that you build yourself. Oh, hundred um, yeah. percent. Because you, and, you know, I, and I, and I bet if you, if you, if you got a, um, a cardboard box that you have in, you know, uh, at home somewhere and you took the, went to the FEMA dot ready website and printed off the list of the things that you should have in a kit, I would probably 
bet you that uh, you know the average American can fill that cardboard box that you're about to throw away with things from around your house mm-hmm. that you've already paid for yep. and put them in a centralized place. I bet you it wouldn't cost you ten dollars to complete that yeah. kit yep. if everyone did that, right? Exactly. But again, in an emergency. Right, you're gonna want all those things. Are you gonna have time to go around the house and go look for it and right. put it in the box? No, you're not. You yeah. don't. Nope. So, uh, again, low cost, no cost. Get a cardboard box. Walk around. Get the list. Print it for you know. Print it on your phone or download it. And walk around your house and see if you can go find it and put it in the box. You got a kit, right? Yep. That's that's as simple as we need to make it. Uh, for some of these things, it turn into a scavenger hunt with the kids. You yeah, know? you can make it fun. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly, make it fun. I mean, exa- exactly, yeah, yeah. Ex- exactly. And build the muscle memory right? of where stuff is and how to use it. All of that is yeah, extremely yeah. valuable. Yeah, yeah, exactly. that's pretty cool. Yeah. So we mentioned we also have personally noticed the gap, right? The knowledge gap. Um, individual community yeah. members often don't know what their responsibility is, and they don't know how to prepare. So I guess the next question that we are very eager to find out is what training resources does FEMA provide? to the community that can assist them in their planning ahead for disasters, right? Like, yeah, it's a great question. Uh, let, let me just, because this kind of is, the, I think, sometimes the mentality about, you know, who is responsible for who. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, again, I, I've traveled around the nation. I've spoken to all sorts of emergency managers from, you know, from territories to tribes to local, uh, small local municipalities to big, uh, to big cities. Uh, in, in some cases, you ask them, you know, hey, uh, what are, you, are you guys planning for X? And they say, uh, no, nah, we really haven't planned for it. Our plan is just to wait for you guys to get here. Oh. And I'm not making I'm not making that up. And, I'm, and, and, it, and people that did not say that to me once. They said it to me multiple times. Oh my I'm God. disappointed, and, and not a, surprised. Can, uh, <laughs> yes, disappointed, not <laughs> surprised. Maybe, maybe the first time that I heard, and, you know, maybe as maybe I heard it as a local and a state emergency manager, it really didn't mean much to me. Right. right? But now as the, as the FEMA administrator, the when guy. somebody says that to you, you have to really, you have to really think that that is a, that's a failure in yeah. imagination. It's a failure in planning the mm-hmm. most basic of tenants, right? Correct. That no, we're just going to wait for somebody else to get here to do Whoa. it. And I, and I think, uh, you know, I think to your question, um, you know, how, what is our responsibility to be prepared? Right. Is that, mm-hmm. that's essentially what yeah. it, what's our, yeah. You you have it's all it's all on every individual to be prepared. Correct. You can't you can't delegate it to somebody else because you will you will pay the price for it, right? Correct. So yep. you you have to you have to take those actions. Um, and again, you know, it, it doesn't cost a lot. You just have to think about it. Uh, and I think one of the one of the, the one of the uh, the cheapest things, free again. Well, I love free. Mm-hmm. Is the FEMA app, right? You yeah. can put your you download the FEMA app. You put your Zip code in there, and you can look at the risk for your neighborhood in, in detail, right? Correct. And then, and then from there, you have to like, okay, here's what, here's how we're gonna, here's how we're gonna move forward from that. Yeah, we love the app. We we preach the app yeah. hard in yeah. our community emergency planning we're, class um, because also too, you have the ability to put I think up to five different zip codes. So I've got friends all over oh, yeah. the country. Yep. So I put all their zip codes in, so I know when they're getting their alerts and their warnings and I can go and check in on them proactively through that app. We love that app. Mm-hmm. It's a really, really great option. Yeah. yeah. We're going to be talking about the app in a future episode. We're actually, we're hoping that or they're just waiting for approval, but we're going to be getting some, some representatives from the FEMA app team right. to come and talk about it on the podcast. Yeah. Good, good. About that. yeah. And you know, just because I, I had, a, I had a, a few pet peeves while I was at FEMA, <laughs> um, uh, the, the app was great. Right. But one of my other pet peeves, and this kind of goes to like local, you know, uh, not necessarily individual uptake, but local uptake. I pause, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. The the uh, integrated public uh, alert and warning system, right? Uh, uh-huh. that, that you get on your phone. So um, when I first got to to FEMA, I asked because you know at the time, you know, remember missiles, missile uh, faults, missile alerts from Hawaii and yes. the rest of it, right? It was it was a, it was a big deal. I actually went to a congressional hearing on it, so it, it's a big deal. So I asked, like, what's the what's the uptake of iPods across the country? And when they showed me the map, I was like stunned that that not everyone, because it doesn't cost you anything, right? right. It's, I, mean, I mean, there's some things that you have to do, but if you run an agency, it's the cost of doing business. And so, uh, you know, we called it the iPods gap and trying to close yeah. that gap. So every community in America, every county in America could receive a emergency warning. And that is necessarily not necessarily the case today. So, 
again, it's the individual, it's local emergency managers. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's the individual driving their local emergency managers to make sure they have iPods because again, it's one of the like building blocks to make oh, sure right. that we are a, a, a ready and hopefully more resilient nation. Yeah. yeah. So that early warning. <laughs> yeah. 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 Absolutely. Did I answer your first part of that question? No, maybe I got up on a little No, I think it was good. Question. Yeah, we were wondering what okay. training resources, and that's what oh, we're... Oh, training resources, yeah. yeah. I, listen, there, there is, you know, FEMA, um, you know, uh, Mercy Management Institute in, uh, in Emmitsburg, if you guys have been there, uh, uh, they, we train, we are, when it comes to Mercy Management training, there is nobody better right. than FEMA, right? Yep. We train millions of people a year uh, in the classroom, uh, in states, uh, with with uh, non-resident courses uh, and uh, online, right? Yep. Millions yep. of millions of people, yep. uh, both professionals and and uh, you know uh, uh, and, uh, citizens. Yep. So anyone can go online today. Uh, you know, you can just Google FEMA uh, EMI, right? FEMA EMI or FEMA um, uh, uh, Independent Study Courses, courses yep. right? I S, yeah, I C S courses, yep. and you'll you'll see. I don't know how many Just courses thousands. they have today, but yeah, yeah, maybe too many. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, there's, uh, yeah, I know the yeah. ICS courses. We're well, getting our fair see, share of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So you'll see courses on there, uh, you know, that are aimed at the at the you know the individual, yep. right? How to how to better prepare your business, yep. how to you know better prepare your family, hazardous materials, understand those kind of things, all the way up to like FEMA professionals, right? Things that the average you know the average uh, citizen has no interest in, or really you know it's it's really not. Uh, what they're what they're looking for, but there's plenty of stuff out there for free. Uh, you get a little certificate. You may even get some credit uh, if you if you're trying to uh, uh, you know uh, you need like college course credit or something. It's yep. all there and it's all for free. And it's it's much improved over the years, right? A lot of it was you, you guys remember. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's pretty standard. They're, they're a lot more interactive, a lot more simulation, yep. uh, a, a lot better content as we as we mature. Yeah, and a lot of yeah, times what it's we out, found, it's out there. Yeah. And what we found initially, I feel they were very very targeted towards those in emergency management, right? It was for yeah, I, I think that's. And that has yeah. that has changed over time. More stuff for yeah. citizen base, so that the civilians and you know, late and, and I think an probably I mean, aimed at the citizen. I think ready.gov is probably yep. the other best place yeah. to go, right? Because there's all sorts of, you know, from pets to you know to uh, your business mm -hmm. um, uh, across the board, kids, right? All that yeah. stuff is yeah. on ready.gov. Another great resource to dig yep. into. Yeah, Agreed. yeah, we talk about ready.gov a lot. It's uh, definitely a great resource. Yep. So, um, so now, of course, you're not with FEMA anymore, um, but you're now the senior vice president and director of. National Resilience Response and Recovery Programs for the Lero Group. Um, so, could you talk a little bit about uh, Lero, um, what they're all about, um, and the type of work you're doing there, and, and how does it fit in with um, you know disaster preparedness and, and resiliency? Yeah. So, uh, Lero is a mainly, uh, I think, historically a family-owned company, uh, been around for thirty-five plus years, uh, based out of Long Island, New York, uh, engineering company. Uh, architecture company, design, project management, construction management, environmental, and they have a probably a more regional uh, disaster recovery practice, right? So mm -hmm. mostly, you know, the Northeast. Uh, they're owned by uh, a parent company uh, called GISI, Global Infrastructure Solutions, Inc. Um, and there's a, there's a host of companies that belong to that family, mostly construction companies. Uh, Lero is is one of the few that is not construction, just really more in the in the uh, design and management uh, uh, world. And, and um, they asked me to come on board to expand the disaster business across the nation. So we're in the process of doing that. Um, and again, we're we're trying to expand. Uh, and and good things take time, so yep. we, we're still working at it. Uh, but uh, you you can find us online and a full range of services. Uh, from disaster services to, uh, you know, construction services to project management, the whole family, the whole GIS, GIS family is pretty robust. Very nice. nice. Awesome. And that's really nice. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I think uh, the other topic we could probably talk for hours about, too, is when we talk about gaps in preparedness is, is building codes and, oh. <laughs> and, oh, yeah, yeah. and things like that. So are, are you working, uh, does Lira work a lot with that as far as, like, resilient housing, oh. resilient infrastructure? We. I think we have in the in the disaster recovery part of it, right? So um, following Sandy, uh, Leo did a, did uh, led the effort to, and I and I it was before I, I got there, but 
uh, one of the uh, little um, small um, towns that get impacted by Sandy and uh, flooding. Mm-hmm. Uh, the name escapes me, uh, but they they rebuilt like uh, twenty five hundred houses, right? Wow. So a bit yeah. a big effort on that, yep. and and uh, so building codes, right? Yeah. Um, and again, some people like you know if if you already own a house or you rent. Uh, and you're not building a house, you probably have no interest in building codes. Um, but uh, if there's one thing that is absolutely local, right, uh, is building codes. Yep. Uh, yeah. You know, federal ma- the federal government can, uh, you know, can encourage, uh, can recommend, but they can't, you know, they, they don't mandate because it's really a local issue. So your local town manager, your local mayor, your local city council, your local building official, Right. They're responsible for making sure that your community has strong building codes. And so why does that matter? Right. So I used the example of um, 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 uh, Mexico Beach in Florida. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. That had yeah. a hurricane come uh, come through and completely wipe out uh, Mexico Beach mm-hmm. and um, a beautiful, small little village in Florida. Uh, old, old Florida kind of building standards, right? Not new, robust Miami kind of building standards, but, you know, this is Panhandle, uh, Florida. Uh, and I, I don't know how many houses were in Mexico Beach, but, uh, but let's just say that really only two of a couple hundred that were there survived, yeah. right? And, um, and, and everything else was wiped out. Well, it was wiped out because they had, they had, ancient building codes mm-hmm. and it wasn't in the interest uh of uh citizens that live there or the or the you know the town itself to to, to change because it costs money and it uh it upsets people and right all those things that you know communities don't want to change they like status quo but you know come you know the aftermath of the hurricane then you have nothing left right yeah. And so now you go back to Mexico Beach, they probably have the strongest building codes of the nation yep. only because they got hammered by, uh, you know, a hurricane mm-hmm. and, and, uh, and they learned a, a hard lesson. So, you know, it's the, the trick is, can you convince your local elected officials, your local planners, your local building officials to change the building code before a disaster happens? So you're more resilient, right? right so you yeah. can not have, 98% of the housing stock wiped out, but maybe 2% of the housing stock right. wiped out because yeah. you took, you know, measures to protect the, the most valuable thing in your life, you know, outside of your family is your home, right? Yep, absolutely. That investment. So building codes are a big deal. Uh, we, we probably have to do more at every level to kind of championship the, uh, champion those. I know FEMA is working on it hard. Um, and, and we continue to, to focus on that because it is really, again, locally, it's where it starts, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Those, those, those disasters start locally and end locally, right? Absolutely. And they can, they can end at the local level in an ugly way, or they can end at a local level in a successful way. And, and, and it, and if you had strong building codes, it will be more successful in the end. Yep. Nice. I think that's a, a perfect setup for a future episode because yeah. we're going to be talking with George Siegel and his uh, documentary film, The Last House Standing, coming up. So yeah. we're going to be yeah. <laughs> talking about yeah. that pretty it's, soon. It, 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 it's great. Yeah. So uh, I, I talked to George and we both, we both have the same outlook on that, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but but it's like it, it goes back to where we originally started. People don't think it happens to them. Yep. You know, why do I need flood insurance? Why do I, in some cases, why do I need homeowners insurance? I own the home. It's not going to happen. And and we've seen what's happened across the nation. So again, it starts with education. So thank you guys for educating uh, the nation's uh, taxpayer because um, education needs to be continuous. Yeah, that's that's that's, that's, that's what we're trying. That's, that's what we're goal. trying to do. That's what we're trying to do. <laughs> trying to be more like right. our buddy John Scardina. He he's a, another uh, emergency manager that we had on, and he's kind of the reason we've gotten into this kind of mentoring us. And he was talking about when he went into purchasing a home how much research he went into looking at all the hazards and he actually had to change his real estate person because they were trying to push him in one area. He's like, Nope, I'm not, I'm not interested. I've already looked at all the demographics for that area. (laughs) Not interested (laughs) at all in that area for X, Y, and Z reasons. And he's just a really brilliant guy. And he took it upon himself to make sure that he did that and set himself up in a good location prior to even (laughs) purchasing. And that's what we're trying to be, right? If we can work 
in the future. Min- minimize the risk, right? He min- he minimized his own risk because exactly. he he, he sought out that knowledge. Yeah, yeah exactly. Starts yeah. that identifying the that's risk it. and <laughs> like identification risk assessment. Yep. That's it. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, Pete, um, for coming on Disaster Class. It was a really pleasure talking with you. Um, Besides Lero, um, the Lero group, is there anything else you wanted to plug? Anything else you're working on? Or um... Uh, no, again, I think it's it's some of it's some of the basics, right? So if you're just scratching your head about what what should I do, what should I do as a citizen or you know uh, you know a family member, just do do one thing today. Do something really really simple. uh, You know. Uh, you can you can prepare yourself from the comfort of your couch, yeah. right? Uh, you have you have the your phone in, in your hand. Uh, Google the FEMA app, download it, put in your zip code, sign up for alerts, and you and you're more prepared now, right? Yep, it's exactly. that simple. So yep. do one thing today, America. Go do that, and uh, we'll be a more resilient nation. Uh, for the next c- catastrophe that uh, that impacts. That's Excellent. Beautiful. We're gonna put a link for our listeners in this uh, description and in yeah. the show notes for they can go ahead and download. The yeah, that'd app. be great. That'd yeah, be great. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Pete, thank you so much for coming on yeah. disaster class. We really enjoyed talking with you and uh, hopefully we can have you visit again soon. Yeah, it'd be great. Yeah, anytime guys. Thank much success. So much, thank you. <laughs> All right. You're welcome. Disaster class is brought to you by instinct ready. Whose mission is to educate, prepare and equip individuals, households and families for disasters through quality education and premium products. Use promo code DISASTERCLASS at instinctready.com for 10% off site-wide. When you need an emergency plan, you need Doberman Emergency Management. Whether you're buying a home and want to know about your local hazards, or you're a professional needing additional support, Doberman Emergency Management can help. Visit DobermanEMG.com today to learn more. Well, that was pretty awesome. That was cool. um, Definitely, that was really cool talking with uh, Mr. Gaynor there. Yeah, uh, he's a wealth of information. That's 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 for sure. Well, before we conclude this episode of Disaster Class, as always, there's homework. Yeah, so please get in there, uh, like and subscribe to Disaster Class. Leave us that five star rating um, and give us a thumbs up. And please comment. Uh, in in the notes there, what you learned or appreciated from this episode. Yeah. And as always, if you have any questions, you have a preparedness tip, a disaster story to share, send us an email at disasterclass at instinctready.com or drop us a message on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn. In doing so, we'll always put you in the running to win some cool stuff and be featured on the show. So thank you guys so much for tuning in to Disaster Class. Stay educated. Stay prepared. Stay equipped. We'll see you next time.